a huge uh, aloha and welcome. Thank you so much for doing this, Dennis. Aloha. Thank you, David. And it's great to have you on. Been a fan for a long time. And uh, oh. for folks who are tuned in right now and excited about this, because this is a special kind of gig to have you guys rolling through town in 17 years. I don't remember uh, the band coming through unless you did so very, very, very quietly. Uh, explain. No. <laughs> explain. No, uh, we haven't been. 38 years and we haven't been there, no. Wow, you've never been? No. This is the debut of 10,000 Maniacs in Hawaii. Absolutely. What a huge thing. Well, we're having a very special little chit-chat today. And, and for the folks who are obviously going to be curious about this, uh, and, and I did a little homework on it, but it'd be nice to hear in, in your robust voice, tell us who is in the band these days. Well, we uh, uh, we have I'm in the band, Dennis Drew. <laughs> uh, I'm a founding member with Steve Gustafson. We went to high school together. We met in 1972. We started the band with uh, Rob Buck. Back in 1981, that's why it's 38 years. And and John Lombardo, he's in the band, and Jerry Augustiniak, he's in the band. And then for the last 26 years, we've had a singer, uh, Mary Ramsey, uh, who's been with us 26 years. She actually was a backup singer and a viola player with us uh, before that, so she's been with us for 30 years, just about. And uh, she took over the lead vocals about 26 years ago, and then. Uh, our uh, original guitarist, Rob Buck, he passed away in 2000. So uh, for the last uh, 19 years or so, we've had Jeff Erickson, who was actually Rob Buck's guitar tech. Wow. So he knew all the secrets and all the tunings and all the weird stuff that Rob did. Rob was a real mentor to him. So he's the new guy in the group, and he's been here 19 years. <laughs> wow, that is cool. And he's been he's been with you a while. Mary's been on board a long time. And that's cool how both uh, those two cats have that connection that extends, you know, beyond just being new. They were connected to the band previously, yeah. which is absolutely su super cool. And Mary has been with you guys a while and just a ferocious talent. This woman to listen to her sing gives you chills. And actually, you guys released a cool live record a couple years ago, which uh, mm -hmm. fans probably know about live at the belly up. And we'll actually at the end of our, our conversation go out of our chat today with a classic done live on that recent live record to give folks an idea of just how well Mary fits the sound of this band. But for people who are not familiar with Live at the Belly Up or what she's been doing for the decades with the band, uh, describe for fans what's in store at these shows, in particular if there's going to be any kind of, uh, from what I understand, you've been doing an acoustic-ish kind of thing these, these days? Well, sometimes we do. You know, it really depends on the venue. But, you know, Mary is a great player. You know, she's classically trained. She plays an electric Zeta, which is a combination of a viola and a violin. So that gives us two soloists. So now there's a lot more back and forth and a lot more music being played. I'm not going to venture out and say we're a jam band of any kind because we, <laughs> you know, we play a song. We play songs from all the albums we've done. Uh, but there is a lot more playing. And we dig into some of these songs like we never did before. And with uh, Jeff... Uh, who's got a real young, younger mentality? Uh, we're not like a, we're not always a, we're not really a folk rock band. We're a rock band when we play, although we can quiet it down and play just beautiful music with beautiful viola, and then we can turn it around and go Jean Luc Ponty on you <laughs> and just just take off. So it's it's really wonderful with some of the back and forth uh, that the two soloists can do, Jeff and Mary. So you know, it's a, it's been, a, it's such a pleasure now. I mean, it's really been. It's really been exciting. What a cool reference. In all these years, no one brings up John Luke, and I was a big big fan of his solo stuff, especially when he was in Mahavishnu Orchestra for a couple oh, of records. Oh, yeah, come too. on, man. Yeah, of course. Dude. I mean, there's not many people you could compare Mary to because she's not a fiddler. She doesn't play bluegrass, you know. Um, you know, she can do. We, we put out a record a few years ago of all uh, British Isle folk music, and she's fantastic at that. You know, the British Isle folk music, which is a different kind of playing than your traditional like bluegrass or country fiddling. So we have a whole record of that called uh, Twice Told Tales that we put out. And uh, but then she's also classically trained and she's got a jazzy feel. She's done different things. So. You know, the music can go in a lot of different directions. And that's cool you point that out, too, because the violin can do a lot of stuff. And it's ironic because a recent guest on the show was Keb Moe, and one of his mm -hmm. first experiences that we talked about for a while was Papa John Creech, who he worked with. Who yeah, was a, yeah. A totally you know, different... Papa John, 
I think one of his last shows was here at, in Jamestown, where I'm where I'm talking to you from, at our little theater here. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, the guy was a monster, and and God yep. bless him. Um, so very cool. So uh, and it's neat. And the, and one of the reasons I asked how you guys were going to do it at the gig was because. This venue has, it's the Blue Note, but in, in the modern world, and I don't know what they do at all the other Blue Notes, so forgive me for not being an expert on how the franchise there operates things, but it, in this venue, you get a lot of uh, different kinds of stuff that's not jazz or blues, and sometimes rock acts come through, they'll do like a stripped down kind of version, not that the club, mm -hmm. re not, not that it, the venue requires anything like that, because uh, mm -hmm. you, can, you can do whatever in the space, and certainly I remember when the Yardbirds came, that might have yeah. been the most rocking show I've ever seen in there. I was it was jaw dropping to see. So this is going to wow. be great to see for fans because, as you said, you're going to be rocking it out in there, and uh, that's just going to be fun because it's neat. The space. A lot of people, I would have to say, uh, of the rocky kinds of cats, you're going to be one of the only ones that's done that besides the Yardbirds. So that's going to be a real, real treat to fire it up and make it a little bit loud in there. Yeah, we do. Uh, you know, not. But the cliche is we go from a whisper to a roar. I mean, we play it. We, we play all that stuff. And, uh, um, you know, we play plenty of quiet venues, but we also just, we play festivals with, you know, eight, 10, 20,000 people too. So we can, uh, we can go either way. And it's, that's a great thing that we get to do. It's not the same thing every night. We can play a small little venue like the blue note or city winery and we can play a stand-up rock venue in uh, San Francisco, and we can play um, really neat theaters, you know, and, and, and mix everything up. Sometimes we bring horns. I don't think we're bringing horns to Hawaii. Sometimes we do a, you know, a set where we do five or six songs with horns. So uh, it's, we, do, we like to mix it up. I dig that. And fans of 10,000 Maniacs. Uh, and again, we're talking with Dennis Drew from the band. Original member, co-founder, keyboardist, and, and certainly you mentioned Dynamics. Always been a part of your mm -hmm. music. So that's cool. And well, there will be a, a plenty of that, it sounds like, in store for these shows. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. it looks like when you're not busy with the band, uh, you have an unusual second gig. It's a, from what I read, and I could have it wrong, and forgive me if I do, that you're the GM of a nonprofit radio station in Jamestown, mm -hmm. New York, WRFA. What is this all about? You know, I started in radio and in the Radio has been a big part of this band, but I do run a community radio station. I started a community radio station here. But back in 1978, Steve Gustafson, our bass player, and I started a college radio station at the college here in Jamestown. And that's where we met Natalie. And that's how we hooked up with Rob. And that's how we hooked up with Athens, Georgia, because we, we would send, uh, we had a list of other college radio stations. When the band started, we would call up these college radio stations in Athens, Georgia, you know, and they said, well, you play at the 40 Watt Club. And, and Sue Murphy was the GM of their college radio station. She said, and you can sleep at my house. <laughs> and we did that all over the country, calling college radio stations back in the 81, 82, 83. So uh, radio has been an integral part of my life. I was a DJ um, yeah, on, a, on an AM station. <laughs> You know, back when I was 19, and uh, and I always stuck with it. And uh, the opportunity came up to put together this community radio station. I jumped at it. And the great thing is, is that I, I have the flexibility to do, still do 45 shows a year with 10,000 Maniacs. So uh, it's the best of both worlds. I dig it. You got that kind of voice too. It sounds like uh, you'd be good on. <laughs> I'm on every morning. Yeah, I, right. I, sometimes. I play, I play, you know, I, I drive to Chicago and play and then drive back from Chicago and then I get up at five in the morning and then I'm on the radio at seven, to, uh, you know, uh, with my liberal swill, as some people like to call it. <laughs> and you have a, it's funny, you talk about that. It, the show is called Small Things Considered, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I dig it. That's it was, it was with a good name, yeah. That's great, and uh, and it's got it's cool. And if people look it up, it's a little cartoon image of you and and I guess the other cats that you uh yeah that you co-host with. It's great. It's, it looks like you're ready for your Simpsons debut with that thing. I know it looks like that. Yeah, we uh yeah, that's our our artist does all our work, and he does all the Maniacs T-shirts and all the Maniacs work too. He's like one great artist in town, so he does everything. That's but uh, that's WRFA 
lp.com. You can listen to us anywhere. I think it's cool, man. That's that's funny. Uh, I love the image. I thought, wow, look at these guys. They're ready for animation. Um, <laughs> and also, when you if you run out of things to say, you can say, all right, well, here's another track of mine. <laughs> Throw down a little uh, ten thousand maniacs. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of uh, we got all this. We got all the special tracks there. We've got our BBC sessions from back in the. 80s and 90s and all kinds of fun stuff you could that we get to play on that only I have. Right, that's what I meant. I mean, it's uh, I was kidding, but but uh, but sort of serious too because I figured you'd have a little uh, a library like that because you guys when you uh, and you gave some um, indication of it and and dialing back because as you know from radio, there's lots and lots of people who have a tiny bit of familiarity with the band and uh mm -hmm. and they're cruising around and they know a song or two but but they may not realize some of what you said which is that there's a very organic start to the group and that was in an era when formatically college stations were doing something alternative was truly alternative and it was done a lot of the time by college stations and you guys right. got a, a ton of support in that way so there would mm -hmm. be a lot of unusual broadcasts and, and, and that sort of thing in, in your archives. And thinking about that, take us all back, because uh, history is always a fun thing. Uh, first yourself, what, what, what was it as a young dude that drew you to keyboards and music in general? Maybe to give credit, could have been a big brother, mom and dad, that taking you to the Kiss concert, who knows what it was. Give us a little feed, uh, feedback on that. Well, my dad was a big music fan. And, you know, he loved Sinatra and he loved Count Basie and he loved Benny Goodman. And Count Basie is a very minimalist piano player, great piano player. And Teddy Wilson was a great uh, piano player, uh, also that played often with um, Benny Goodman. And um, I think, no, not with Duke Ellington, but some other guys, really great piano players. Uh, and uh, they bought a piano for my sister, an upright piano for my sister when I was, you know, 10 or 11. And she started playing piano and uh, showed me a few things. And... We kept a piano in the house after she went off to college and got married and all that stuff. So I just played. Uh, I had a friend show me one, four, five, <laughs> <laughs> which is the root of all music, all rock and roll music, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, so uh, when I, once you learn one, four, five, and then you find out where the two and the three and the six are, you're done. <laughs> I, I take <laughs> So we, uh, I just did that, you know, and the music I liked early on was, you know, my, 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 my sister, my late sister, you know, she was uh, uh, from Elvis through the Beatles, you know, she was 65, she was 17. And uh, so I, I, I got all that music. I got all the Beatles and Stones. And she also uh, turned me on to uh, uh, Broadway music, Funny Girl, West Side Story, Fiddler on the Roof and all that stuff. In fact, I went to Syracuse University to be an actor. Uh, after high school, so I was uh, I loved I loved Broadway and I loved pop music, and I discovered Bob Dylan, you know, in uh, when he reemerged in the early seventies, concert for Bangladesh and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know that's that's my musical background from Frank Sinatra to Bob Dylan to The Grateful Dead to Gang of Four uh, to Ten Thousand Maniacs. I dig it. It's cool. A lot of diversity there, like a lot of the cats that uh, that we get to talk to. And that's a, uh, w I was looking at some of the na names are often fun to hear about. Not all the time, but sometimes bands. Your first one was called uh, Still Life, right? That brought you guys first together, at least, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Still Life was, uh, that was Rob and Natalie and me and Steve and uh, a guy who's now an osteopath and, and actually Rob Buck's wife before they split up so that was an interesting band yeah wow and and you guys all come together in and it was about 80 81 was that uh that was january january february of 81 we actually got thrown out of our first gig as still life <laughs> uh they threw us right out of the bar because so many of our fans were underage and oh. we got into a fight with a bouncer about c cigarettes and dance floors and so yeah, that was a real punk rock thing to do. We were a lot more punk rock then, and it was we were really proud that we got thrown out of our, after our first show. We were on a six band bill, you know what I mean? How it was in those days on a Tuesday, right? <laughs> you know, the punk rock night. Nobody comes on Tuesday, so you guys can play Tuesday. <laughs> uh, it's a good one. It's a badge of honor, as they say. To have yes, it is. 
to have <laughs> on your thing. And uh, 2000 Maniacs, I, I used to dig the uh, the B horror movies on on the weekend, um, and uh, really dug them when I when I was a little boy. That nowadays I don't I don't really uh, I haven't watched one in a long time. But 2000 Maniacs, I don't know that film, but apparently it, it inspired your unusual band name. Is that accurate? I've never seen the film. Uh, we had a list. We had a book of movie titles. Okay. <laughs> and we were just as we were as um, as still life fell apart and John Lombardo joined the band. Uh, you know, we were still life lasted for about six months and and it started to crumble and uh, you know we started rehearsing with John and getting better. We just had a book of movie titles. We kept thumbing our way through this book of movie titles, writing down names and you know, arguing about them, you know, changing them. Uh, I wanted to name the band after the Pair Ubu record, uh, Dub Housing. <laughs> but because it was a Pair Ubu record, they they wouldn't, they didn't want to do that. They, people would think we were a cover band for a band that nobody had ever heard of at that time. Right. So, but um, uh, we had, the last three names we had on our list were Men Against the Arctic, <laughs> Dick Turpin's Ride to York and 10,000 Maniacs because 2,000 was too wussy. Right, right. I dig it. Well, you chose a, uh, that's cool. And it's cool you never saw the film either. Now you're going to make me, uh, after our thing, tonight at least, I'll try to dig it up and see. How, that's the great thing about YouTube, huh? You can just see just about anything. Yeah, I know. Almost I anything. So I'm going to see if we can uh, watch that myself at, at home. And I read it was right around now, uh, early September, in fact, 1981. You ended up doing the debut as uh, 10,000 Maniacs. Now, you're illustrious. Your first gig at Still Life has such a great story. Do you have Do you have memory of the first 10,000 Maniacs gig? Any story goes along with that? I don't have a great story for that first gig. You know, we had played a little bit. We were uh, starting to figure it out. We had a different drummer. We had Jim Foti. We had... Uh, I don't even know who was playing in the band then at that point. I think we had uh, Dwayne Calhoun was a guitar. See, Rob Buck got mad at us for a couple of weeks and went back to work in a factory. <laughs> so we actually started with uh, an African-American guitar player, Dwayne Calhoun. And he, he used to say, don't, I, I don't need to know the chords. Just tell me what key it's in. And he would just play, and it was it was wild the first couple of then Then... By October, Rob was in the band by back in the band by Halloween. Um, but you know, his, his wife they had a thing, so it was a you know, so it was a different era there. But uh, yep, yeah, Labor Day 1981 was the first one, and by 1982 we moved to Athens, Georgia. Actually, now Atlanta, Georgia, we moved to uh, because uh, John Lombardo had some a contact down there, and we 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 bought a school bus van. And uh, and drove and painted it uh, red, green, and gold, and wrote "Sing Out with Joy" on the side of it, and drove down to Atlanta, Georgia, because REM was from down there. And we worked with Johnny Hibbert, who um, had produced the uh, Radio Free Europe sing singles, and put those out. And um, that's that's when we really started to bond and really get it together, and weren't a local band anymore. And you guys ended up doing a bunch of touring and stuff with REM, and we're close to them, yeah? Oh, absolutely, yeah. They're great guys, and and they were really good for us. They were good for a lot of bands. Uh, yeah, we did, and uh, uh, that was that was certainly good for us. You know, it helped us uh, quite a bit. But, uh, you know, they just came to see us. They came to, uh, you know, you ever hear the band Pylon? I have not. Pylon is another Athens band, you know, from the early 80s. Um, so Pylon and REM came to see us at the 40 Watt Club, legendary 40 Watt Club. If you make it stateside, you got to go to see 40 Watt Club. I think it's still around. But uh, so th th it was a really great atmosphere in Athens, Georgia. You know, the B-52s were from there and uh, Little Tigers and Love Tractor and REM. And Pylon was a really great band. It was like a uh, three-piece. And... Um, their bass player came to see us and he said, you got to call our agent in New York, Frank Riley. So I did, and uh, Frank said, well, if Michael says you're good, I'll I'll come and see you. I'll get you a gig up here near, in New York, and I'll come and see you. And he did, and he became our agent, and uh, things started to take off. So bands helping bands, people helping people, that's how it works. And that was absolutely 100% how, how it works. And that was the band Pylon that was instrumental in getting you that agent is what you're saying? That's right. 
Michael Oskowski. That is that's cool. That's neat how that. Uh, and then the uh, when you talk about folks helping each other, and I may have this part wrong, but was it REM that got you on your first national tours, or did they play oh. a role in that? Yeah, yeah, they invited us to come out and play. You know, we uh, we, we we ended up playing in Atlanta. We had then we found a friend in Atlanta, and we slept on on the floor of Louise McGovern's <laughs> apartment uh, for uh, two weeks at a time. And we'd go down to Savannah and play. We'd go out to Athens and play. And we'd play the clubs in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, they would come to see us and their friends would come and see us. And uh, eventually when we got a record contract and and, uh, the record company would put up the money for us to be able to do a national tour. Because, you know, when you do a national tour, the gigs are like eight, nine hours apart. And they're every single day. You know, it's not like, you know, you take days off when you're on a national tour and, and REM work hard. So we, uh, yeah, they invited us out there. They invited us to play with them, you know, and we did. And the great thing was Peter Buck would come out and play with us. Wow. The opening band. He'd come out and play Don't Talk With Us or, or a different song. And, and uh, Michael would come out sometimes and sing songs. He'd hang it on the record. And Michael would come out sometimes and play and do Campfire Song with us because he actually sang it on our record. So that's that was, so cool you know yeah yeah so yeah he came out he would come to see us in a lot of cities and then we we, we had a thing i think i don't know in 92 or 93 where when he would come out and do tour he'd do some shows with us because he you know he and natalie's were, were good friends and he would do uh um uh we're caught in a trap What's that Elvis song? Yeah, right? yeah. Because uh, I love you too much. But he does a great Elvis. That's Michael cool. Stipe does a fantastic Elvis. <laughs> so a, we would do that song in an encore, and people would go berserk. It was hilarious. <laughs> what a great bit, and that's a great one from uh, from the King. Uh, no, we can't go on together with suspicious minds. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you sing it good too. I dig it, man. And there's a big Elvis market, as you know. So, uh, oh yeah, Aloha from oh, yeah. from Hawaii. And so, yeah, so that's cool that REM uh, did that with the uh, your first uh, national gigs. And and also, we talked about this connection with uh, or national tours. And we talked about this connection you've had to radio throughout the years, and yourself keeping it keeping it very much alive. Uh, early mm-hmm. on, you guys also benefited from the interest of legendary late BBC radio host John Peel, yeah. correct? Absolutely. We, uh, <clears throat> John Lombardo in the band is a real Anglophile. You know, he's a big Fairport Convention fan, you know, um, uh, Albion Country Band. Yes. Uh, all the um, all the British bands, uh, Kinks, you know, obviously the Beatles and Stones, but some of the other ones, you know, that people never thought of, Brinsley Swartz and stuff like that. And so he says to us, you know, we make our first, we press that, we, we were the first independent record company, one of the first ones, you know, we made our own record. We went, we went up to the local college and we recorded, they had a little recording program, we, we made a record, we went to a, a guy that did jazz records up in Buffalo and we pressed it on vinyl and we sent him to uh, college radio and then we sent it to the BBC, we sent it to John Peel, John said, Lombardo said, send it to John Peel, he's the man. You know, and, uh, and we did, and he loved it, and he played it. And in 1983, he had a peel. He has a worldwide show, you know, on the BBC One, right? It was a worldwide show. Anybody that could get the BBC, listen to John Peel. We were voted the 23rd, I think, most popular song in 1983, you know, with the Smiths and U2 and The Cure and, and New Order and all these bands. And, and 10,000 Maniacs was in there, and the song was My Mother the War. And uh, that opened a lot of doors for us. That really opened the doors for us. And, uh, yeah, we love John Peel, met John Peel, did some Peel sessions. You know, uh, they, they had this great thing over there where you go into a studio and you get a, a, a producer or an engineer and you record like four songs, you know, any way you want to, quickly in one day. And then they play them on the radio like Friday night and it's a big deal. So we did that for John Peel, and our 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 producer was Buffin, the drummer from Mott the Hoople. Oh wow! <laughs> wow! Yeah, so it was great, great stuff like that, you know. Yeah, John Peel was instrumental in our success for sure. 
No, that's cool. To be, I mean, he has so many cats that he helped out oh. like that. And so many of those, what you're talking about, it's a great point about um, riffing back to what I was saying about YouTube and just the uh, now some of those sessions, a lot of those little quick sessions that people would do, four tunes, five mm -hmm. tunes, are starting to emerge. Some of them who just sat there for, for a very long time. And um, and I've really enjoyed a few of those. Uh, There's a real obscure Black Sabbath session that uh, he got four or five tunes out of them that was really cool to listen to and i didn't even you know wasn't aware of till i was much older than when i was really a, a big fan of them so it uh i dig i dig the the way that he was able to be instrumental with a lot of different kinds of music and a lot of people was it because of, of john peel that you guys first played in the united kingdom well yeah certainly that helped uh we, we first time we played over there was 1984 um mm. we a lot of people thought we were from england back here because our, our first success actually came over there because of John Peel. So we we, uh, uh, we hired a manager in the spring of 84. He was an English guy. Uh, the guy that signed us to Electra was an English guy. So, uh, but, but in 84, we, uh, uh, our English manager decided that, you know, we should try to go over to, we should try to go to England. So he, he the record had done very well, done very well over there. And, Another funny story, I had, uh, um, this, the, it was Secrets of the I Ching that came out in 83, and I sent it to Jeff Travis over at Rough Trade Records. Rough Trade is, that was a famous label. I don't know if people still remember that. But, uh, and I call him, he says, I, I call him overseas, you know, back with the big clunky phones in 1983, <laughs> and I dialed, you know, the international code. And I call him up, and I say, you know, so what did you think of the record? Do you think you'd put it out in England? And he said, you know, I'd love to put it out because I think it's a great record. Um, but I have this new band and I can't, I can't handle anything else. I have this new band called the Smiths and I can't, I can't press any more records because I can't keep up with the demand for their records. Now he goes, but you go to this other guy and um, he'll put it out for you. And he's a good guy. So, they put, you know, they, they put it out over in England and, 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 and Peel got a, Peel liked it too. And, uh, he had already been playing the record Peel had, but then we got the, this other company to put it out. I don't remember their name now. And so the record was out so we could go to England. We played three or four gigs We played the fridge in Brixton. We played Dingwalls up in Camden Lock and we played the marquee. So we had a really good time. That is happening. I dig that. And was uh, how soon is now? Was that their great instrumental? I use that as a music bed sometimes. Is that the name? Yeah, of that, that has that great sound. Yeah, yeah. I think the you know, the first one was this charming man was their biggest. Hit. That's their first hit. I think. Yeah, I just love using that thing to talk over. Is what I'm saying. It just sounds yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and you guys, uh, some covers. One thing, the uh, the Cat Stevens Peace Train. I was always been curious and and was not able to see any reference of of if you ever got to jam that with him. Did you ever meet him or play with him or get feedback from him on that? Well, so in typical record company fashion. <laughs> We put out in, in my tribe. We, we we record all of in my tribe, and uh, and it obviously had some hits on it. Of course, they said we don't hear any hits on this. Uh, you better do a cover. <clears throat> so Peter Asher says, uh, "You guys know any covers?" <laughs> uh, and I said, uh, "Well, you know, right before we came out here to make the record, we played Peace Train in Ithaca." And he goes, great, let's do that. <laughs> and uh, he knew he knew Chad. Who, I don't know who this was. was it Chaz Chandler from the uh, Hen Somebody. Hendrix manager guy. Yeah, it was actually uh, Cat Stevens's manager back in the day. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so we we did that, and uh, um, you know it was a big production and everything. And then of course cat stevens comes out and endorses the ayatollah Khomeini's death sentence on uh salman rushdie salman rushdie right so there was a firestorm there and uh we we had two concurrent thoughts number one that's not our song on the record so if we take it off uh we're going to get more publishing royalties and number two what a firestorm over this God damn rush deep thing. So let's get it off the record for sure. <laughs> so we took it off the record. Um, and, uh, 
years later when when um uh, uh what is he Yusef Islam wanted to come to the United States he wrote us a letter and said that he um that he was misconstrued uh, that he just reaffirmed his faith in Islam that he never said he he didn't say he didn't endorse Khomeini's uh, fatwa, but he, he said that he was just a good religious man and uh, uh, that doesn't wish anybody any harm and didn't think anybody should be assassinated. And uh, we said, okay, that's cool. And, uh, you know, with enough, he said that to a few people. And, you know, we wrote a letter. We, we, we acknowledged forgiving him for whatever he did, and he got his visa, and he got to come to the United States and play some shows. Wow, so you played a role in that, it looks like. And he's, yeah, and he still sounds great. Well, he re <laughs> didn't he revert back to his, to Cat Stevens though now to make a little change, right? You can't make a lot of jingle with the uh, routine that he had been doing. No, no. But he had made a ton of money. Those were big records. Oh, yeah. Well, if he had, right, he stored it all up, and then you can change your name and do whatever you want. But but he did, uh, apparently, maybe he had not <laughs> stored as, yeah. as much of it as, as uh, we're thinking. But, but he did come back to being... Uh, Cat Stevens. And, and so even with that, so did you ever, so still fantastic story, no. by the way, you're a great storyteller, but, but did you, you, so you never have actually physically crossed paths with the dude? No, no, I haven't. No. Wow. No. Interesting. Interesting. Um, well, he's not really over here very much and he doesn't play in Jamestown and I don't really leave Jamestown unless I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> I dig it, brother. I dig it. And, uh, well, a good, good excuse on, on both parts of that. And ironically, as you yeah. were, as you were saying, uh, earlier which is really cool kind of connection that your current singer mary ramsey has she actually you would uh, and you can explain a little bit more she had been associated with the band when natalie merchant was still in Ten Thousand maniacs and mm -hmm. explain how that and also the project the john and mary thing with with john lombardo yeah well john is a mercurial talent and an interesting guy and he's left the band a couple of times and come back a couple of different times you know um so that's whatever that is but uh <laughs> when he left the uh, first time um i'm walking around a little so tell me if this uh i will you're good up. so far good so far uh he uh you know he left in uh, 80 uh, six and went and formed a, a duo with mary john and mary and, and you know and they got a, a deal with Ryko disc and they put out two or three pretty good records and um yeah so after he put out that record uh with john, with mary uh you know that you know we we just remained friends he's it was like an am, amiable thing and we just we were going to do a tour and we said john you want to come you and mary want to come and open for us in england and around the country and he said, yeah, sure. So they came, and they opened for us, and then Mary would stay and do backup vocals and play viola because she played on, on – uh, then she played on the next record, which was uh, Our Time in Eden. She played on that record, too. So, you know, this is going back to 88 or 89 when they, uh, you know, they were opening for us and playing with us, and, and we did uh, uh, a bunch of early songs, too, with them. John would come out, and we would do Can't Ignore the Train, and – we just had everybody out there, you know, on 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 this one tour. So it was like Rolling Thunder review or something. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we uh, so we got along, and then uh, and Mary and Mary and Natalie were friends, uh, still are. And uh, um, so Mary was, you know, ingrained in the band, knew all the songs. Mary is, you know, musically, I mean vocally very similar to natalie you know, right the same range and everything totally yeah. in that late 80s period didn't you guys get a chance to you mentioned them earlier in the show um or earlier in our conversation didn't you open for the grateful dead right around then at some point yeah we did yeah man that's the best that's you know steve and i were deadheads you know in the late uh 70s you know when we got we got out of high school about 75 so then we were we love the Grateful Dead, and we kept bugging this uh, one promoter in New York who would, uh, to, to get us on to play with the Dead, Bruce Moran. And, um, you know, our record came out in 89, uh, by Manzu. And, you know, they sent the stuff. We played we played a football stadium with the Grateful Dead. I know. In 19, July 4th, 1989. 
And uh, Jerry was just out of rehab. He was fantastic. He stood on stage during our whole – he and Bob Weir stood on stage during our whole sound check and hung out with us. All right? Wow. So we're done. The, the, all of a sudden, there's a PA glitch. Something happens with the PA, and we all got to stop. So Garcia goes, smoke him if you got him. <laughs> so we went back to uh, his tent there, his little guitar world. And uh, he said, you guys want to smoke some weed? And we go, yeah. And, and, and Rob Buck, who had the best weed in the history of the world, goes, yeah, here, let's smoke this. So we smoked this joint with Jerry Garcia on the 4th of July, 1989. And Jerry Garcia says, hey, man, your weed's better than our weed. <laughs> Greatest moment in my life. That is such <laughs> uh, he, And that's the last summer of the camping and vending being a legal and welcomed part of their scene. By the way, oh. my, my friend, I saw them 44 times myself. So I um, Right on, right on. I didn't get to 44, but uh, we were uh, deep into double digits for sure. Um, so that was a great, great, great time. That was in um, in Buffalo and and Fourth of July. And and there's a there was a DVD. There is that concert is out, but we're not in it. They cut us out for some reason. But yeah, I remember tr trucking up to Buffalo. I I remember. Uh... Mm -hmm. I worked mm -hmm. at a rock station. We did a little promo. We actually screened it, as I recall, at a club around, around here. What a cool memory, yeah. though. That's a great story. Yeah. And no other contact with them after that. Was that basically it with those cats? Yeah, I think so. I don't think we ever got to play with them again. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it was only about... I started having kids, and, um, you know, the band, you know, Natalie left. Things got a little bit hairy there for a while. So, you know, we weren't... You know, we weren't always the most sociable guys. There was a lot of things going on with a lot of bands in those days. But yeah, man, hey, no worries. I mean, still, you got the story, Dennis. Come on now, that's like, uh, and you tell it. You got you tell it great too. That's going to be in your uh, in your bit for sure. <laughs> There's no <laughs> no way I can leave that one out. And and when uh, when you did the Bill Clinton inauguration thing, uh, yeah. Natalie Natalie still at the helm at that point. It was '93, right? When you uh... yeah, that was the MTV uh, inaugural ball. And uh, we played with En Vogue <laughs> and so uh, Soul Asylum. Oh wow! And yeah, and several other. It was unbelievable, un freaking believable. I'm walking. I'm, there's a there's a VIP area where you can hang out, and there's like Chrissy Hind and Mary Louise Parker and all these movie stars and Robert De Niro and all these people. You know, like holy cow! And uh, it was just amazing. So we. Uh, we got to play, and Michael Stipe came out with us and sang uh, To Sir With Love. Uh, and uh, <laughs> little did we know how a song from a high school girl to her mentor would <laughs> presage the rest of his presidency. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I thought you were going to say for a second, and he came out. Never, no contact with him at that sort of thing? Did he come around and say hi or any of that, or dance or play, uh, do anything? That you way? know, I was out front. You know, looking at, um, you know, Chrissy Hind and these other stars watching the rest of the show when he blew in the back. No, you couldn't be around for that stuff. They they, they cleared rooms. They the, the security for that stuff is unbelievable. No doubt. No doubt. And and uh, and as before, we wrap it up. We've mentioned Natalie Merchant a few times. And uh, it sounds like at, at least your singer, Mary, um, who does have an uncanny similarity to Natalie singing. It sounds like uh, at least she and Natalie still have a relationship. She, from what I read, announced to you guys that she would be leaving for a solo career a couple of years before she actually left. Talk about that and, and have you retained a relationship with her? Well, first of all, yeah, I mean, she was about eight hours away, but we do uh, business for sure. She's been more than generous in all our business dealings and because she's got a lot more clout than we do. So she's been great for us. Really great and done a great job, um, um, you know, in publishing deals and different things like that. So it's been great. Uh, but, yeah, you know, before we recorded Our Time in Eden, which came out in 92. Uh, so we started it, I think, probably started writing it in 91. Uh, she said, this is the last record I want to do with you guys. But I'll tour and I'll, we'll, do it, we'll, we'll do it up. We'll do, the best, we'll do whatever we can. And we said, okay. And uh, so if you, that is specifically what that song, you know, 
is about and what that album is about. Um, you know, it was announced that, you know, this is it. These are the days. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, our time in Eden. Uh, it was, you know, her farewell to making art by committee. She always, we always thought she was, we knew she was always going to leave. You know, that was never, I mean, that was pretty easy to see. She's a strong woman. Uh, she had what she wanted to do, and she was tired of deferring to other people's ideas. And uh, I think she had a plan that when she was 30, she was going to go do her own thing. Because we met the girl when she was 16, you know, at the radio station back in Jamestown. And, you know, she was playing with us and going on stage in bars when she was 18. So, uh, um, you know, and we were, John's 10 years older than she is. So she was hanging out with men, uh, <laughs> one little girl hanging out with men, driving in a van around the country and sleeping on people's floors. And she worked hard. And she was great. She was great. Uh, but, it's it, you know, obviously she was planning her, her, she had an exit strategy. And we pretty much knew that. And, and that was, you know, that was fine with us because we were, we knew it was going to happen. So, um, you know, we, we made a, a great record. And uh, it was a fond, uh, fond farewell. We, you know, we were never going to stop playing. Uh, we, uh, it was funny because in 92, when we started the tour for Our Time in Eden, Jerry Augustiniak broke his shoulder, our drummer. Mm. When we had two weeks booked in colleges, we were going to do these colleges. It's kind of a warm-up tour, like right as the record comes out. And then we would move on to some bigger arenas and things. But Jerry broke his shoulder like in that August or something, and the record came out in September. He couldn't do anything. So we called Max Weinberg from the E Street Band, Bruce yeah. Springsteen's band, because Bruce Springsteen had broken up the band and was doing his solo stuff, if you remember. Yep. So so Max was out of a job. So we called up Max, and he said, yeah, I'll do it. I'd love to play with you guys. So, so Max Weinberg came and did two weeks with us. We did two weeks of shows. Um, throughout the Northeast. And, um, you know, he said, yeah, Max, you know, uh, Natalie's going to quit the band and stuff. He goes, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I said, he goes, he goes, yeah, hey, man, he goes, you guys are going to be fine because you guys wrote all that music. You guys are writing the music. You wrote most of this music. So you guys are going to be fine. You know, you don't have to stop. And, uh, you know, we took that to heart, and we did not stop. And it's great how... Mary kind of dovetails into the band with the previous experience already with the band, as you as you generously told us, and kept it going. And you chose, it's cool how you chose somebody like that, because sometimes that works. Uh, I remember one time when I was living in Boston, just as an aside, they were this oldie station was doing these free shows on Saturday night in the late 90s. And, uh, and I worked at WBCN, which had been a huge supporter sure. of, of the band, as I'm sure you remember, Oedipus and everybody, and Mark Perino and... And so this was a different station. And on the weekends, I I lived in downtown Boston and my girlfriend and I would go see shows. And I remember Jefferson Airplane came once with that lady, Diane Mangano, that Paul Kantner had hired. And I remember getting chills watching her at City Hall. I will never forget watching them on stage. And this woman could just smoke those tunes like she was Grace Slick. So when I listened to the live records of your own band, you're not kidding. You just kept it going, and Max was right. You wrote the tunes, then you got the right person to fill in, you know, to, mm-hmm. to fit into the band. And mm-hmm. uh, it's worked out just like you uh, like you described. And sometimes that can happen, where you get somebody who's just the right fit and can keep alive what the fans expect, and yet can keep the band uh, happening. And it's also cool, by the way, knowing you're a deadhead, now I get the bus story so much more <laughs> of your... <laughs> <laughs> of your bus that you had <clears throat> that really yeah 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 that that fits yeah. in so we're going to go out with a tune from uh from uh one of the favorite you mentioned the name of it and, and uh these are days it's a huge song from the mm-hmm. legacy of this group and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm presuming that's on playing favorites tell me it is oh yeah okay of course it has to be right um anything you want to say about that jam before we uh unload it for those who are creating because it's a great way to link you the past to the present it just throws it all into one package because it reminds folks that this is what they're going to sound like when you go and see them at uh if if you're going to see them at the blue note this is a little sample sort of what's in store what's up with this Mm -hmm. tune that you want to say about it well we talked about the meaning of the tune which is pretty obvious for everybody but here's a quick story of that song 
Um, that song is in a Hawaiian slack key tuning. It's in an E flat tuning that Rob Buck used a lot of different tunings that he brought to the band. It's a Hawaiian slack key tuning. We don't play slack key on it, but it is in that tuning. So um, he brings it. Our rehearsals, we never ever with Natalie ever had any vocals in any of our rehearsals. We wrote songs with no vocals. She never sang at rehearsal ever. We would record things. She would take it home. She would come back, uh, and uh, then we would uh, th- then we would run through things maybe before we were going to do a show or a sound check where she had words and she would read words out of her notebook. Uh, but we never really, when we wrote songs musically, we never had any words. So we wrote that entire song the way you hear it on that record, never hearing a lyric. We went all the way through. 24 track 36 track recording of it at bearsville studio in upstate new york never sang on it she never sang on it at all we played that whole song as an instrumental we went on to, we, we did shows before we recorded the record playing that song as an instrumental in front of audiences as an instrumental these are days as an instrumental didn't have a title we didn't know the title it was the hawaiian song it was a hawaiian slack key song that's what we called it and then after we recorded this, I mean, completely recorded the song. Every part you hear on it, done, she went in. At the end of the whole making of that record, the whole making of Our Time in Eden, she went in, and it was May. It was May. And she went in, and she wrote those lyrics, and she sang that song. And we heard it for the first time, basically, when we were standing outside at Bearsville, uh, in front of that barn that Jimi Hendrix's picture is taken from and all the people from the band used to be around. And we heard that song for the first time out of the back of a speakers in a pickup truck. Uh, heard the lyrics of it for the first time in May of 1992. What a great venue, too, for uh, recording. As you pointed out, that's a very famous studio and obviously associated with Robbie Roberts and the band and that whole thing and, and other people. Mm-hmm. But um, that's really cool on multiple levels, both the story of how she didn't add the stuff till the end, but also what a, how, how could I have picked the, the one Hawaiian tuning thing? I mean, look at that. You got yeah. you got to love yeah, that. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Synergy. It's amazing. Synergy, my brother. So, uh, yeah, yes, it's, man. It's going to be a happening show. It's Dennis Drew. It's 10,000 Maniacs making their debut in the state. And uh, he's just been generous, telling us great stories. They're tomorrow and Sunday at the Blue Note. They're doing two shows a night, 630 and 9, and a very special connection to this song, which we're going to play uh, right now. I really hope you, you had fun today. I really enjoyed talking with you. You are a fantastic storyteller, and I uh, mm-hmm. really, really enjoyed having you on the show, Dennis. you think I was a professional radio guy if it's on uh... You would think that, huh? <laughs> Hey, David, um, um, are you com- you're coming to the shows, right? I, I'm totally coming. I'd love to come back and say hi if, if it's at all possible. Absolutely. You need to be on a guest list or are you on the guest list? Call me on this phone. You got my phone number. I will. Hey there, my friends. It's Dennis Drew from the band 10,000 Maniacs. I had a blast on the show talking with my buddy Dave Lawrence. And on behalf of 10,000 Maniacs, we give you a big hug. And a high five. I appreciate it, cuz. And I hope you had fun. Oh, yeah, I loved it. I loved it. But my wife gets out of work at 8, and i got to go pick her up. Go pick her up. And thank you so much, Dennis, for doing this. I appreciate it, brother. I'll talk to you soon. I'll see you at the shows. Did a great job, David. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Aloha, brother. Bye-bye.